criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Donald Trump arrived at the courthouse in Lower Manhattan just a short time ago. The judge has instructed him to be in court for every session of this trial. Criminal defendants in New York are required to do that. The presumptive 2024 Republican nominee for president faces 34 felony charges of falsifying business records. Each count could draw a sentence up to four years in prison if he is convicted. This case involves so-called hush money paid to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election to stop her from revealing an alleged affair with Trump. And this is the first of four distinct criminal cases brought against him. This is the first to go to trial. The former president denies all wrongdoing and calls the trial a witch hunt, a phrase you've heard before. Uh, a couple things to note about today's uh, proceedings. This trial, uh, the actual courtroom, will not be televised, although you're seeing a live picture of the president before he enters that courtroom. We will not see pictures inside the court because Judge Juan Mershon has not allowed it. Another thing, last week, the court worked to select a 12-person jury, six alternates. The main jury will have seven men and five women. Let's go now, first off uh, the bat, to chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa, who is outside the courthouse in Lower Manhattan on this historic and significant day for a whole number of reasons. Bob, what are we expecting? Good morning. This is a significant moment for former President Donald Trump. He doesn't want to be here, but he is sitting in a courtroom in Lower Manhattan. Opening statements will begin shortly. The prosecution making its case against the former president, not only that hush money payments were made, but that he allegedly engaged in a criminal scheme ahead of the 2016 election to cover up alleged misconduct, alleged affairs behind the scenes by paying off Stormy Daniels through his longtime fixer, Mike. Michael Cohen, and we do expect the prosecution today to call its first witness, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker. Pecker was allegedly the orchestrator, in part, of coming up with this scheme with Michael Cohen to help Trump sustain himself politically at a critical time in 2016. All right, Bob, thank you very much. CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman is here, along with CBS News senior political analyst, that's John Dickerson. Ricky, let's start with you, because the charges in this case were brought by New York prosecutors. What can you tell us about the prosecutor in the case? The prosecutor that is the district attorney is a gentleman by the name of Alvin Bragg. This is his case. It was his decision to go forward with what we call the hush money case and not to go forward with the case that the attorney general, Letitia James, went forward with, which was a fraud case brought as a civil case. That case was the favorite of the previous DA. This DA said he wanted to bring back the hush money case, which had been called the zombie case because it kept rising and falling. Mm -hmm. um, the DAs, the assistant DAs who are trying the case are very experienced prosecutors. They know this courthouse. They know the rules of evidence and procedure, and it's their home. Mm. This is where they work. That is a big advantage to one side over the other. We were saying other. earlier, though, in the court of public opinion, people are like, what is the big deal here? There are so many other bigger fish to fry. But from a legal point of view, this is a big deal, true? Absolutely. It is a serious case. It's a solemn case. First time a former president of the United States has been brought before court as a criminal defendant. We cannot just toss that aside and say this is not serious. It's a felony case, 34 felonies, maximum punishment, four years in jail. John, I want to get you in here, but Ricky, um, today the opening statements will be delivered. Um, why are opening statements so important? Because opening statements can persuade jurors to not change their mind later on. Eighty percent of jurors, say the studies, will make up their mind at the end 80%. of the opening statements. Before and not, they hear the evidence. Before Ricky. they hear the evidence because of the advocacy that has told them a story. Doesn't mean they can't change their mind, but it does mean that someone it, it, is the teller. It allows you to through. lean a certain way, you're saying. Correct. In most cases. Correct. In most cases, wow. not all. Wow. John Dickerson's also here with us. Let's talk about the politics. 80% of jurors may yeah. make up their mind on day one. I feel like 100% of the electorates made up their mind on this. What, do you, what are the politics? Right. And you know, the political scientists say what Ricky just said, which is once you get an idea in your head, it is really hard to, to unwind to, it. To, to excavate that idea, oh. no matter what you hear. What strikes me is it feels like this case is taking place in a fallout shelter in the middle of a hurricane, which is to say in the room, and, and what's the hurricane? The hurricane is the political season. This isn't extraordinary just because it's a former president. It's, it's the leader of a party running for president. Mm -hmm. So inside the courtroom, 
fairness is supposed to rule, uh, truths are supposed to be important, a certain set of traditions and laws are supposed to rule. Outside in the hurricane, that's all up for grabs these days, in part because of the behavior of the defendant in this trial, who has built his campaign around a lie that the last election was stolen. To maintain that lie requires a flood of mistruths, and it also requires disregarding everything the, the legal system has said about that lie in the last election. So there's a thoroughgoing effort to undermine the system of law going on outside the room, and inside the room, the defendant is protected, and we really hope protected by everybody behaving by the traditions, norms of the way you're supposed to behave in a, in a courtroom, including the prosecutors and the jury. So you have these two things clashing, and that means it's not just about a case about a former president, it's about a challenge of whether the American legal system can be healthy and withstand the hurricane going on outside. But traditions metaphor. and norms, that is a great analogy, as you always have. Traditions and norms don't seem to matter, though, when it comes to Donald Trump. We keep hearing this word unprecedented, unprecedented, but this behavior has been unprecedented. Doesn't it it's feel not just, surreal? But it's not just Donald Trump. Like, I mean, in other words, he claims the election was, was stolen, stolen, but yes. 60 or more courts have said, no, it wasn't. Yeah. Lots and lots of investigations have said, no, it wasn't. What it requires is not just uh, a single person's behavior. It requires his entire party to rally around him, not just the voters, but the people who should know better who are in positions of power in the Republican Party who say, yes, let's undermine the rule of law in order to support our party nominee. And I should hasten to add, we should all be very much on the lookout for all of the possible political influences on the other side of this case. I mean, let's... What do you mean? Like, well, like I mean, you've got a DA here who is from a Democratic city and who is... Uh, in the political system in that city. The jurors are marinated in the politics of New York. That isn't to say that they are influenced, but that we shouldn't be blind to that. Yeah, 87% of Manhattan, which is the jury pool, uh, voted for Joe Biden, not Donald Trump. And, and, and it was one of the reasons that Donald Trump's lawyers continuously moved for a change of venue, yeah. because the entire group from which the jury is drawn already starts out with a political bias. One of the ironies of this case to go into John's world is to look at the fact that what Judge Mershon is calling this case is a case about election interference in the 2016 election. Now we are going into the 2020 for election. So politics has its own way mm. of seeping into the courtroom, even though the courtroom is supposed to be about the rule you of law. Can you tell us about Judge Marchand? Because he's made some interesting rulings already. He's, he's been very, seem, seemingly very even-handed here. Judge Marchand is known as a very strict judge. That is, that he adheres to the rules of evidence and procedure. He takes no nonsense. In this particular case, I am sure that the defense would say that his rulings have have been pro-prosecution. Mm -hmm. um, I think that certainly in terms of getting a jury in the box within the first week, that's mighty fast indeed. Did that surprise you? That the jury uh, it's stunning to me. Yeah. Um, if you look back at the Boston Marathon bombing case, which affected an entire city, this case in many ways affects an entire country, yeah. let alone an entire borough of a city. That case took not only a week, that case took weeks, if not months, wow. to pick a jury. So you're in a very different situation here. Hmm. Like most presidents, um, when they speak, they speak to their loyalists, their followers, their voters, and also their party. When Trump says, I will testify, is he just speaking to those who are following him to show that if they put me on the stand, I will speak? Yeah. Or is he speaking out of turn? I'd be curious to see if he think he's going to testify. Well, he said many, many times in many other venues that he would testify, and then he hasn't. I mean, this is, again, where these two worlds collide. Um, as you're suggesting, Nate, it's very important as a political matter for him to say, I've got nothing to hide, I can, I'm going to talk and all of that. His lawyers may have a very different uh, rule on that. And also the judge... Look, will, Ricky's holding on to the table. Uh, yes. uh, and that's... Uh, we've seen that clash in other cases right. where the lawyers, um, you know, wish their client would, would keep his mouth shut. And there's obviously... That's another one of the side issues here, which is whether what the president has said has run afoul of this gag order. Um, and also what... Well, I think the judge is going to rule today on the other Trump cases and whether any of that can be brought into this courtroom. Um, so there's uh, what he says and what he has done 
Right. Um, well, Ricky, on, on the morning show, you, you were a hard no on your guess on whether Donald Trump will actually testify. Why? Um, number one is his lawyers are going to caution him about how dangerous it is for him to testify because of cross-examination. And then he can blame the lawyers. He could say, I wanted to testify, sure. but right. the hands are tied. Yes. Well, what can I, I and, do? and I'm, sure, I'm, yes. I'm sure that that's not only what Donald Trump would do, but what almost any criminal defendant in court who has a following would do. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to, but yeah. my lawyer stopped me. However, it is the client's right and only the client's mm -hmm. right to decide whether or not he or she should testify. And as I have certainly said and will say again, if I were representing him and he decided that he wanted to testify, I would make sure it was on the record outside the presence of the jury, loud and clear, that he is testifying over my objection. Because mm -hmm. if he were to be convicted, I do not want them coming back at me for saying it was ineffective assistance mm. of counsel. You know, to go back to John's metaphor, which I think is great, the yeah. hurricane of politics out here, and there should be a bunker that is the courtroom where the winds and the rains don't touch, right? It's safe. But to hear you talk about what's happened already in the courtroom, has the courtroom been able to seal itself off from the political world, or has it already been tainted in some way? Well, I think the judge has tried to seal it off as much as a judge can. But you're also dealing with the issue that John brought up, which is the gag order. You have uh, possible sanctions that will be had against Donald Trump when the hearing about the gag order happens. The difficulty you have here, which is why the worlds really collide, mm -hmm. is that you have someone running for the office of president of the United States. He's in the middle of a campaign. So the greatest witness against him in this case, the primary witness, is Michael Cohen. Yes. And he has Isn't been... Isn't he a flawed, uh, flawed witness? He's a very flawed yes. witness, which is exactly why Donald Trump says... I want to be able to say he's a liar. Mm. I have a right as a campaigner and to my followers, let alone to educate other people, to say this man is lying. And you're telling me, Judge Marshawn, I cannot say that. All right. This man is lying who I once hired to lie on my behalf, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a he said, he said, it's a he lied, he lied. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, mm. at, at my request. Hold that thought, guys. Jan Crawford, we're going to bring in another voice. Jan Crawford, she's CBS News chief legal correspondent. Jan, good morning to you. Today's opening arguments, you know, are not the only legal item on the Trump world calendar this week. What else has he got going on? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, Gail, potentially something even more consequential is looming. Kind of to use John's analogy, it's like this tidal wave, uh, you know, a tsunami of legal cases against Trump. And Thursday, the Supreme Court will hear arguments on that really could determine whether special counsel Jack Smith will be able to prosecute Trump for his efforts, his alleged efforts, to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. That case carries carries much greater penalties if he would be convicted in that case. Two of the charges against him carry 20 years in prison. So the, the Supreme Court will be hearing arguments on whether or not Trump can be prosecuted. He, of course, is arguing that he is absolutely immune, uh, that he has absolute immunity from prosecution in that case. He actually wanted to go to the arguments uh, and per to sit there and watch the justices as they take up this issue in a very special hearing. They've just set uh, outside of their normal argument calendar to decide it on a pretty expedited basis. And the judge in the New York case, of course, turned him down, uh, said that he would be in New York. So he will be sitting in that courtroom in New York, assuming they have trial on, on Thursday, which they are expected to, while the justices are deliberating and hearing arguments in a case that will decide if he will be tried by the special counsel. That is all on the horizon facing Trump. A hurricane, a tsunami, uh, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it yes, really it is very, a big day. It really I mean, is a very 45 good different people have been president. Only one has faced criminal charges like this and walked into a courtroom for opening statements. Today's the day. Today's mm. the day, and now it begins. Jan Crawford, we thank you. Ricky Kleeman, John Dickerson, always a pleasure to have you both here at the table. Our coverage of former President Trump's criminal trial will continue on CBS News 24-7, your local news, and tonight, of course, on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Gail King with Tony DeCopel and Nate Burleson here in New York.
All right, if you're just joining us back here at Studio 57, CBS News, uh, former President Trump has just entered the courtroom for his criminal trial. The historic case marks the very first time a former president has gone on trial ever in U.S. history. Both the prosecution and the defense are presenting their opening statements. We expect them in court today. Let's bring in CBS News national correspondent Errol Barnett, who's following this for us outside of the courthouse. Uh, all right, uh, Errol, Trump just spoke outside the courtroom. Uh, what do you have to say? I, I probably can guess <laughs> if it's anything like the last five days, but tell me what the news is. That's right, Vlad and Anne-Marie. If there's one thing about former President Donald Trump, he is consistent. I have a couple <laughs> updates for you. Let's begin with what he said just before he went into the courthouse uh, behind me. He criticized the case. He criticized the fact that this hearing is even taking place. He doesn't like how the jurors have been selected. And he's blaming this case and all the other cases he faces from Florida to Georgia to the nation's capital. And there's another case happening to my left in another courthouse, um, a, a civil fraud hearing. He's He's blaming all of that on current President Joe Biden, and he says it's part of a, a large conspiracy against him in general. Um, but we want to give you an update now on what's happened inside the courtroom now that things are getting underway. Uh, we understand that Judge Mershon has indicated that rather than breaking at 2 p.m. Eastern, which was the plan today and tomorrow because of Passover, they may actually adjourn slightly early due to an alternate juror who is having a dental issue has an appointment they have to get to this afternoon. So that's one update. Additionally, on the jury front, uh, one of the jurors also called in at the end of the week on Friday. If you remember, there was that horrific incident where a man set himself on fire outside of the courthouse. He passed away over the weekend. Well, this juror called the court on Friday expressing concern about the extensive media attention here. Judge Merchant will determine if that juror is able to continue and serve. So we haven't even got to the opening statements yet from each side for the jurors who are seated. And already President Trump former President Trump railing against this proceeding and jurors showing some level of nervousness because of media attention. And there's also a medical issue as it relates to dental work, uh, an appointment that one alternate juror uh, has to make this afternoon. So a couple of those updates uh, from just the past few minutes of proceedings. All right, Errol, thank you very much. You know, we'll be uh, checking in at the top of every hour uh, for any updates. So thank you. Yeah. A foreign aid package that includes more than $60 billion for Ukraine now heads to the Senate for approval after the House passed the measure on Saturday. This comes as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky underscored over the weekend that the aid needs to come in the form of, quote, tangible weapon system. Troops there are preparing for a possible Russian offensive in the coming months. I want to bring in Mary Ilushina for more on this. She's a reporter for The Washington Post. Uh, 